We've come to Minden in central Germany to visit my friend of many years, Dieter Beikersch. Over many decades, Dieter has built up one of the finest private collections of valve era German avionics in the world. Not only is the collection comprehensive, covering important aircraft communications and navigation technology from the First World War until after the end of the Second, incredibly, almost everything in his collection is in original working order. With over 80 set-piece exhibits in the collection, we've got a near impossible mission to give you an overview of this extraordinary collection. Still, if we manage it, we will, in effect, have given you an overview of the best of German avionics in the vital era of the vacuum tube. To do this, we promise to pack in as much as possible in the shortest time. Later, we'll cover the collection and the individual desks in more detail, but today's mission is to give you a taster of the most historically significant parts. But first, we need a roadmap. With nine rooms packed with historical technology, it's easy to get lost. Fortunately, we've got expert help from Dieter and a helping hand from his daughter Sabina to keep us on track. So We've got a lot to show you, so let's dive straight in. The first radio was installed in the German aircraft. It is the uh, Telefunken D4 transmitter receiver, and this is single, uh, single, single from 1917. Yeah? Now we have not enough wind, so I... <laughs> no, it's not good enough. So I uh, put a motor behind this generator, and this, this motor uh, is driven now by uh, main power, yeah? So, here you see the more the key, maybe for the absorber, yeah? Now listen. So, the people on ground Listen to this uh, information. Yeah? For example, I give one time, whatever you know, SOS. When there was a fighter with only one uh, pilot in the, in the aircraft, he can give the information by this knob. Yeah? So he looks down what happened and gives the information as this. Yeah. Any minute now, there's going to be a helicopter overhead trying yeah. to rescue us. Yeah. And here you can see a little technique. You can see the current is going in the antenna. Here, by them. It's not the visible spark itself, but the conductors leading to the spark that creates the radio or electromagnetic waves. From a chart on the wall, Dieter explains that the spark transmitter generates these rapidly decaying or damped electromagnetic waves, and you can see how the power rings down after each spark. If the key is dabbed quickly, we get a dot. If it's held momentarily, we get a dash, and so telegraphy, using Morse code, can be sent. But a spark system like this does not allow telephony or voice transmission. With just a few steps, Dieter moves to 1930 and a giant leap in radio communication technology with the Telefunken 378 long wave transceiver. This system was developed for commercial aircraft and was used by all aircraft in Deutsche Lufthansa's European fleet. But it was quietly adopted for use in the first military training aircraft of the new German Air Force. It would become known to the world in 1933 as the Luftwaffe, in open breach of the Versailles Treaty. The radio was designated Fuge 21, and like the spark gap technology before it, this radio system was also limited to Morse telegraphy, transmitting on a fixed range of frequencies between about 300 to 500 kilohertz. But crucially, it used the new thermionic valve or vacuum tube technology. Dieter explains that from 1933, this new technology allowed radio transmissions to carry the human voice. Yeah, with the microphone. Yeah. And in the, in the 1930s, far, here was the first radio station for the fighters, because the fighters want not make telegraphy, they want to talk. Yeah. And this is the first radio station. Uh, FOK7 uh, for the uh, uh, T-38 
telephony. So the ground station from the uh, uh, from the um, rescue aircrafts from Holland. You see here the Donier 24, and in this aircraft was also this station. You see it here was uh, uh, made to uh, rescue the pilot was down in the sea. Yeah. Okay. So we go to the next station. Here you can see the FOB3. The Telefunken Fuge 3 onboard radio system saw service from 1933 and was developed from an older marine or navy radio to respond to the needs of Germany's new air force, the Luftwaffe. Intended for aircraft with two or more engines, the main difference between the naval receiver and transmitter was the dramatic weight reduction and changes to the power supply. The wind generator, essential to the earliest versions of the Fuge 3, when used with the Heinkel 111 or Junkers JU-52, was typically located on the top of the aircraft. The fully working version of the Fuge 3 we see here is presented as a ground station. It was also used like this in mobile units as well. In this picture, we see the Fuge 3 receiver and transmitter built directly into the aircraft. In this picture, we see an operator being trained in the use of the system. The wind generator powered the transmitter. The receiver was powered by 90 volts from dry cell batteries. Yeah. <laughs> to, to show how this machine works, we need power. Yeah? But this power came from the wind generator. But we don't have wind enough here. Yeah? And so I, 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 I make a motor and put this generator Powered with a motor. While Dieter's sorting that out, there's just time to point out that the boss or hub of the wind generator's propeller has a speed governor that automatically varies the attack angle of the blades to keep the rotational speed constant. Dieter explains he's removed the inspection cover so that we can see the valves. The large transmitter valve here is a Telefunken RS291 tetrode, and you can find out more about it in our video that looks at thermionic valves in more detail. Dieter's installation is fully operational, but he explains the vacuum tubes need 30 to 40 seconds to warm up before the system can be used. He also points out that each Fuge 3 transmitter was supplied with a unique calibration table. You can see it framed on the case, and it's quite distinctive in photographs of other examples. The tube performance drifts with changes in the environment, temperature and so on, and requires calibrating at power-up using the details on the little chart fixed to the transmitter. The Morse key is pressed to make a test transmission, and an ammeter allows the power output to the antenna to be monitored. And we can also check the transmission on a nearby frequency counter. Dieter mentioned that the transmitter had not drifted from 3,800 kHz since the last time the unit was operated. But he speculates that this consistent performance is because the set is kept in a temperature-controlled environment. On a 1930s aircraft at altitude, it would probably show more variation. Dieter explains that the first versions of the Fuge 3, the transmitter was powered only by the G3 airscrew generator. This means that the aircraft could only transmit while flying. Later versions, called the Fuge 3U, used a motor generator or umformer powered by batteries. The Fuge 3 desk is presented with a complete range of test equipment, accessories and spares for the system. Test gear includes instruments like the artificial antenna that Dieter is pointing to here. Dieter points out that the Fuge 3 was essentially an older system called into service as a stopgap in the early years of the Luftwaffe. But in the mid-1930s, electronics technology was evolving rapidly, and Telefunken had developed new vacuum tubes that were much smaller and had more reliable base fittings. These new tubes weren't only more efficient, their robust mounting and connection systems made them more suitable for military use as well. Eager to exploit this new valve technology and bring their radio communications up to date as quickly as possible, the Luftwaffe offered a competitive contract to Telefunken and Lorentz, two of Germany's most competent manufacturers. 
The specifications called for a modern, modular, high-performance radio system for aircraft with two or more motors. The result was one of the war's most sophisticated aircraft radio systems, the Lorenz Fugue 10. From 1939, it became the standard equipment for larger aircraft with several crew members. This is a complete Fugue 10 laid out once again as a test station. It was used like this for workshop maintenance and training. Dieter explains that the Lorentz design exploited the new smaller transmission tubes and the new compact P2000 pentodes, allowing an impressive reduction in the size and weight compared with earlier radio sets. This was very big. This is one radio in the same dimensions like before. Yeah, Very, very small and uh, not so heavy. And uh, the, the speciality was you can take this, put this here in the in the frame, ready. The Lorentz quick release system was mandated on all aircraft radio installations. The SL set is for long wave transmission and EL for long wave reception. The SK set is for the short wave transmitter and EK the receiver. The long wave was to talk to the ground or tower. The short wave was for plane to plane or tactical communications, but also for ground communication as well, depending on the conditions. Dieter explains an important development in the Lorenz design. On the old system, when you will uh, switch uh, 20, yeah, you have to look on the table, look on the table, and then look here, look here, here. No, here you have the direct, the exact frequency. Yeah? And this was a big problem because this was not dig digital like today. This was analog. And... Uh, Analog uh, systems are going with the temperature strong, up and down, goes with the altitude, up and down, and this was a g great um, development from Lorenz over a, a great range of temperature. This, the frequency was the same. In comparable British and American radios, frequency stability was usually achieved by switching to different crystals, and this limited the range of fixed frequencies. The Fugit 10 allowed the direct selection of any frequency free from environmental influences that might cause the frequency to drift depending on altitude or temperature. The Fugit 10 had a cable antenna that can be let out up to 70 meters to trail behind the aircraft. A second antenna was fixed to the roof of the aircraft and attached to the tail. But both antennas could be used interchangeably between long and short wave if one or other was damaged, and they could be switched from inside the aircraft from this box. Dieter explains that this box is a dummy load to test the power output and is not installed on aircraft, only the workshop test panel. Although the set is fully functional, DETA can't demonstrate the receivers as there are no stations within range during the day. But the transmitter can be used. The set is capable of telegraphy and telephony, with longer ranges covered by Morse code telegraphy. Maybe I, I can listen noises. Yeah. The headphone, yeah. Maybe you listen to noises. But you cannot listen to any station because all the stations are. In, in the other frequency, yeah? Okay, but we, I can show you the transmitter. Yeah? <coughs> the transmitter gets special power for the, uh, for the remote control to adjust the matching to the antenna. We can later look for this. The radio operator has to look on this instrument. You can see this, yeah, yeah. So he he press here, so and has to to just the just see of maximum, yeah. So, but this was with with drops power that the enemy not listen. Oh yeah, now they start, yeah. But the, when he was in the air and made uh, uh, communication with the, maybe with the key, yeah, then they correct this on the mark here on the maximum. So, yeah, so. Lots of functions can be accessed from this panel. For example, when flying long distances 
all the crew can listen in to a music broadcast. This knob, marked with the abbreviation for Microphone Schuen, or Microphone Protect in English, to disconnect the microphone of a crew member who is making a lot of noise, like a gunner. The power-operated antenna is shown here. It has a lead weight at the tip and can be trailed behind the aircraft for up to 70 meters. Yeah, stop now. But I have stopped this inside, then the stop become, come when this uh, weight touch here. Yeah. Dieter is showing the remote cutter that allows the crew to sever the antenna if it can't be reeled in for landing due to ice or maybe combat damage. Looking at the rear of the test panel, Dieter shows us how Lorenz used a synchro electric remote apparatus to control the process of matching the transmitter power to the impedance of the antenna, to ensure that the most efficient transmitting power was achieved. This, you can uh, change the inductance with this for the short wave and for the long wave. And to have the optimal, optimal uh, the connection to the antenna, then you can remove, move this coil. Please, Sabine, move this. You see? Yeah? And this is remote control. Yeah? Here for short wave and here for the long wave. Yeah? Thank you, Sabine. This was Vogel 10. <laughs> I've lost you. You're ahead of me. That's it. I've got you again. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. running on ahead. From the Fugi 10, we move to a smaller system, the Fugi 17. The Fugi 10 operated on long wave and short wave and allowed communication with ground stations on long wave and plane to plane or tactical communication on short wave. But although the range was excellent on shortwave, and all the aircraft in the wing could listen in, so could the enemy. The Fuga 17 was a new system that employed ultra shortwave, or VHF, with a much shorter range and was an ideal tactical radio for close air support for aircraft with a three-man crew, pilot, observer and gunner. The instrument had an intercom so that the crew could talk to one another. Morse could be transmitted, and all crew had headphones and microphones so they could talk to other aircraft and ground stations. The Fugi 17 was another instrument from the Lorentz stable, and of course used their rapid replacement Good. system. Easy, put out, put in. Yeah. Okay, this was Fugi 17. Here's the antenna maybe. The top mounted antenna we see here is damaged, but a picture shows how it should look and Dieter shows us the connections in the base for antenna matching. The presentation is in the form of a test panel that would have been used in the maintenance workshop of an operational airfield to test all components in the system, from the radio set to the Umformer motor generator. Yeah, that was for 17. Just two steps across the room take us to the Fugi 16. It sounds like we should have looked at this first, but in fact, it came after the Fugi 17. The Fugi 16 became the standard radio telephone set with ultra shortwave VHF used in all German aircraft from large multi engine aircraft to single engine planes until the end of the war. In larger aircraft with two or more motors, it was used together with the Fugi 10, but in fighter aircraft, it was used on its own. The set was used exclusively for telephony or Vox communication, with no telegraphy or Morse code option. It was intended for use by just one operator, not two or three, as we saw previously. Dieter explains that once again the set is presented in the form of a workshop test panel, where every component can be tested, including the power output of the instrument. The system was also used in setups like this in ground stations and mobile stations in vans and trucks. So, I can start it. So, <laughs> first I have to heat, to, to heat the tubes, yeah? And when the tubes are warm, I have to put the umformer. 
So, you know, this is the motor generator who makes the high tension for the tubes. Yeah? So, but uh, I stop this too, too loud. Yeah? <coughs> the Fugi 16 test panel that Dieter has reconstructed also has the additional pile roof or beacon call automated direction finding apparatus mounted alongside the main test board. This equipment allows the lone pilot to automatically call ground stations to get a report back on his exact location. Dieter explains that in the melee of an air battle over England, aircraft may lose their way. So the system can contact the direction finder in Germany and announce automatically, I am aircraft Epsilon 5, please find me and tell me my location. So I have to start again. Yeah. So this is a, the normally the normally radio. You can talk and, and so and so on. You can talk with the other fighters and so on. <coughs> and here special when you want where you want to know where I am, you give the uh, station in Germany, please tell me where I am. Yeah. So and this was so. Here's, here's a clock, yeah? You see the clock? And when the clock, this is the white area here, yeah? Uh, watch what happened. As norm you can talk now for the normally um, telephone. But what happened now? It comes here. The transmitter changes the frequency. Yeah? Changes the frequency and the aircraft gives gives a code. Yeah? So that in Germany they know, aha, this is uh, aircraft XY and you will know where he is. And so they make um, with the beam, the, yeah, the beam, three beams, three beams, and tell him you are now here in this position, yeah? So, and here, and the pilot knows in this white field, I cannot talk, I have not to talk. For this the clock in the white field. This is a normally frequency to talk, to normally a telephone here, and <coughs> when it comes in this field, see? sent a special code. Every aircraft has a special code. Yeah? Understand? Yeah? Okay. So, so and, and when it's away, turn back to the normal frequency. The automatic system takes control of the set, changing frequency and sending a Morse identifying signal and then restores the set back to the normal telephony frequency. And all this is achieved by a single remote switch in the cockpit, significantly reducing the pilot's workload. Yeah. This was called peep squeak. <laughs> peep squeak. Peep squeak. And comes from the English. The German copy of this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What? What you can see more? Uh, the Fuga 16 was also manufactured using the modular technique we saw earlier, making installation and maintenance much easier. Yeah. Okay. This was a uh, proof tafel uh, 16, the last uh, radio in all fighters and all. Uh, uh, German uh, planes. In the same room we have the Fugi 16 ZY or ZY. This is the same VHF transceiver used in single-seater aircraft for Vox communications, but here we have additional equipment for Y-Verfahren or Y-Control. 
in which aircraft were fitted out as fighter formation leaders that could be tracked and directed from the ground. The display shows the principal equipment as mounted in the Messerschmitt 262 and 109. The thin panel on the right hand side carries the remote controls located in the cockpit. The system worked by using ground transmitters known as Y stations. Each Y station could control five fighters. The Y station would send out a signal picked up by the Fugu 16ZY. This signal was repeated by the transponder and sent back on a frequency 1.9 MHz lower than the transmitted frequency. Using a radio direction finder, the angle was measured and the range was calculated by a timing system connected to the transmitter and so, the receiver. And um, what you see here is the, the, the green ground. This is the original uh, ground. Uh, ground was also so in the Messerschmitt 109 and was also in the Messerschmitt 262. Yeah? Here you can see pictures from this in the Messerschmitt 262 and here is a picture from the Messerschmitt 109. Usually only one fighter in a group was fitted with the ZY system, known as the Y fighter, and it was specially painted so that it could be seen easily and followed by other aircraft in the group. The usual control range was up to 250 kilometers, depending on the aircraft's altitude. Dieter points out the two antennas the system uses. The one at the top is for normal communications, and the larger whip aerial, usually located underneath the aircraft, was used for distance measurement. The drum-shaped antenna matching boxes can also be seen. The system was used to control fighter groups intercepting Allied bomber streams day or night, and it was sometimes used to direct individual night fighters. Dieter points out that we can't demonstrate the onboard direction finding as there are no suitable stations in operation. But this system could also be used to help locate and rescue downed aircrew. Fighter pilots would have this compact transmitter and could signal their location if they ditched in the sea. He took this uh, radio out of his fob pocket, yeah, put away this, so, and when you put away this, talks. So, moment. Now, the, the uh, man in the water is left from the direction. Now, he is right from the direction. Yeah? And so you can find him and you fly direct to him and can help him. Yeah? This was a Fugin 16Z. So, okay, I think this was the um, communication. And now we go to the direction finding. The men on this place listen this and make a, a, a direction finding, see this number, and has a, this place was, some, for example, here in Solingen. Yeah? Make the direct, make the beam to the aircraft. And this number, he have seen on this uh, pile frame, uh, he makes the same on this uh, scale and put the, uh, the, uh, the Faden, we say Faden, here on this position. And a second, a second um, operator on, in, this, in this town makes the same, yeah? looks also on the, uh, on, on, the, on the numbers, and go here and put this here, and where there was, was a cross, there is the aircraft. And from this we say cross pylung in German. Cross pylung. Yeah? And the apparat we're here and the pipe uh, the, the piling frame is here. Yeah. Yeah, this was the uh, the, the direction finding uh, with the um, with the aircraft has not owned direction finder on board on board. Yeah? Okay? But now we come to the own piling. When the aircraft has uh, own pile system, 
here we see the direction finder was called in German Pile G4. Yeah? And it was so, in, on the top from the aircraft was this antenna. And here is a pointer, and, in, and the pointer has to stay always in the middle for the correct flying on the beam. Yeah? But you have to steering with the, with the aircraft to find this right way. The Pile G4 is one of the first onboard direction finding systems and it can indicate direction directly from the received signal. Previously, navigating an aircraft could be a complex and labour-intensive process for the crew. Dieter explains with a chart. Here we see a plane that wishes to fly from point A to point B on the left. But a strong wind is blowing from north to south and constantly pushing the aircraft south of the desired course. At a typical point C, the aircraft must calculate its current position and make a right turn onto a new heading to point B. And the deviation from the desired flight path only gets worse. The course has to be corrected again with another right turn and a new heading, and so on until point B is in sight. This chart, using the onboard PAL G4 direction finder, shows a much simpler process. The aircraft starts once again from point A, but no calculation is required. By simply keeping the needle in the cockpit indicator centered, the plane automatically flies a wind-corrected direct course to point B. The process does not require an observer or a navigator, and the pilot can easily use it on his own. The system guarantees the shortest, quickest route to the destination with the minimum crew effort and fuel usage. I I start the station, this is a direction finding on the aircraft, but the direction finding was only on the, on the roof of the uh, aircraft and you have, you have to move the aircraft and watch this instrument. Yeah? So, this you can listen and now, now I go to the direction finding. Yeah? And you see here, Du, du, du. That is a signal from the uh, from the uh, airport, yeah. And you see, it's very strong. We are nearly on the airport, yeah. And when it's in the middle, we are on the right beam. Now we are to left. Now we are to right. Exactly, I am this in this way. Airport or air, so a town, what you okay. want, yeah. And so you find the, the shortest way for finding the way. Okay. <laughs>
is the remote mutter compass, though rather than mother in English, we usually translate this as master compass. Dieter points out that in the older system, the loop antenna, as well as causing drag, could be something of a combat liability, with the plane's gunner accidentally shooting across the aerial and destroying it. Later models featured a low-profile beam antenna controlled by an electric servo motor. The new DF antenna had an iron ferrite core and was more sensitive than the older air loop design. See, this was also mechanical problems. Dieter demonstrates the lever and hand crank remote control for the EZ2 receiver. The mechanics of the Bowden cable control system could be a source of difficulties. Later versions of the EZ2 used an electric servo motor system to control the receiver. And this was made better with, uh, with the motors. Yeah. Now I have not to turn on the on the uh, kurbel wings. <laughs> and now we can. Yeah. This was this was a better one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, what you see here is the last uh, direction finder was also used until the war, but was also used by the French uh, aircrafts until the 1960. Yeah, what we can see here, first is the, a new compass, yeah. Here the antenna is not outside on the, uh, the roof, this is inside in the aircraft uh, roof. Here you see the antenna turning by hand, right or left, to find the correct beam from the radio station you will see. This is a beam antenna, it's moving, and this on top is the uh, normally antenna, so we, so we know the antenna from the normally radio is here. So here you see the receiver, here you see um, a special system amplifier V6. Above is the compensator. Every installation of this type of direction finding equipment requires calibration of the antenna and receiving equipment. Uh, here you can see inside the, the parts, this is a compass, this is the uh, instrument for finding, yeah? and this is also the same with this uh, pointer left, you are, you are the, the, the uh, target is left from the, from, the, from the flyway, and here is right from the flyway. Here is a, a test, a test uh, switch, uh, the, um, the pilot, Flugzeugführer, can uh, pull out this compass and he can check the compass is full working. And here is the... Um, here we see the potentiometer used to connect the direction finder to the aircraft's autopilot. Also on display is a test box that could be attached to check the accuracy and alignment of the antenna with the magnetic compass. This was all. Here you can see, uh, compare German with American. Yeah, you see much big, but this, and this is the, the American antenna. Oh, here in this room, uh, we see also a way to find the correct place for the aircrafts. So, for in this, this system has two antennas. The uh, first antenna is this, for the, for the beam detection. The second antenna is under the, under the fuselage from the aircraft to detect it, the signals in front of the, uh, of the airfield. And here we have the, the uh, receiver for the beam, and this is a receiver for the signals in front of the, uh, of the air, uh, airfield. Here's the uh, motor generator. Uh, 
Here's the indicator. We are left or right uh, from the from the beam, and uh, here is the selection for the for the uh, for the channel special channel you need for the airport. I I adjust this. First, I have to start. <laughs> so. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, we can start with the, uh, we can start to show the system, how it works, okay? This portable radio transmitter was used as a field test device for blind landing radio receivers installed in an aircraft. It'll allow Dieter to simulate radio signals from the beam antennas and the proximity beacons as though our system was on a flying aeroplane approaching a landing strip. Nehmen wir. Das Flugzeug ist zu weit links. Der Pilot bekommt Punkte zu hören. Tüt, tüt, tüt. Korrekt. Right. Correct. Left. Right. Okay. signal fresh <laughs> nasty the next is this very important also uh, this is the Sprechtrebarke, Peach Turn Barke. Was so. Here, for example, you see uh, an aircraft, yeah, and they don't know where I am now. Where, yeah, where I am, you don't know the fighters have to fly plenty, plenty turns and so and so. Where I am now, so and then was this. Uh, um, the, the Barker, when he only can listen in this area what the, what the Barker speaks. Yeah? Normally you see, here is different. So it's what's working. Yeah? Next. Here you see some parts from the search and rescue when somebody is fallen in the, in the water. They sit in the uh, gummy boat and have this uh, uh, dynamo between the legs, turn, and then was uh, a kite or a ballon for more than 60 meters uh, antenna. Oh. Yeah? Okay, the... Uh, the uh, men down in the water had this gummy boat, I told, then they have a life vest, yeah, and uh, in the, the gummy boat was in the, in the, in the package on, on the back. This was at the beginning, and later comes the electronic searching for the men in the water with this uh, piling systems, yeah. 
hier ist der Receiver und die äh, Antenne. Und an dieses Instrument, you, you can see, the, 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 the pilot in the water is more left or more right. Yeah? And here you see how is the distance to find him. Yeah? And uh, now, <coughs> when, you, when you find him, uh, you call the rescue plane and they take up the mates from the Gumba boat on these uh, wings. I show here now the beam was, uh, was used to fly from uh, French to England and uh, Evelyn uh, remember this uh, crazy uh, situation when they fly from French to the, uh, to the town Coventry to make bombing the uh, uh, factories. Yeah? Uh, how it was, how it works. Here from this uh, station came a beam directly to Coventry. And the beam worked like we have seen before with dashes and with dots. Yeah? Also the, the pilot had to listen dashes, dots, in the middle was the permanent tone. So, Dieter explains that the direction beam, what the Germans called the marching beam, is aimed directly over the target, in the example shown, the city of Coventry. In front of the target, three transverse beams, named after rivers, also transmitted from occupied France, were laid across the main direction beam at distances of 30, 10 and 5 kilometers. The pilot flew steadily on the direction or marching beam. Later, an autopilot was used, until he heard the first transverse beam, called Rhine, at the 30 kilometer mark. From here, the pilot must carefully regulate the plane's altitude and speed. Now the bombardier listens out for the continuous tone of the second transverse beam, called Oda, at a position 10 kilometers from the target. On hearing the tone, he presses the start button on the X clock. When he hears the tone of the third transverse beam, the Elbe, he presses the start button again. The X clock now calculates the time to the target from the known 5 km distance between the Oda and the Elbe beams and the speed over the ground and triggers the bomb release automatically. When the red hand overlaps the black hand, the bombs begin to drop. The details for the bomb release were set on the X-Clock ground equipment, but the final exact moment of release was calculated by the X-Clock on board the aircraft. And here you see the re receiver for the main beam, and this is the receiver for the three uh, help beams. I speak so, yeah. Now here's the, 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 the X-Clock, we say, Here's the main, main course, yeah? and here you see when you're in the near of the uh, uh, help beams, you see this also on this uh, instrument. Here's the power supply. So this was the uh, x Fafan Wotan 1. Here are some pictures uh, from the bombing man, has here the clock and so on. Uh, sit here inside, and this is from the uh, from the English, was found in a crashed aircraft. Yeah. So, we have seen the, uh, the first uh, beam, X-Wotan X 1, and here we come to the, the next version, more simple. We have only one main beam, uh, and, but only one cross beam. Before we had three cross beams, yeah. So this was more uh, more easier, but it was also not so exactly. The the circuit from the from the bombing was nearly more 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 three three five hundred kilometers, yeah. So that was the name Knickerbein because it, the name came from this. Uh, clicking antenna. The receiver was the same receiver like we use for the uh, 
blind landing system, what we have seen also before. Yeah? And here, on, on this uh, instrument, you can also see you are correct on the beam, your left or right. With the same manner uh, was, it, was it being made, left points, right dashes. Yeah. Okay, this was all for the clicker bind system. Also, we have seen the Wotan 1X uh, system, we have seen the clicker bind system, but this system was disturbed by the English. Yeah? And so the German uh, made an, 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 another uh, version, uh, not with the dots and the um, and the uh, dots and slash. Yeah, they made another uh, system, uh, very very uh, complex. Here is uh, showed how it is how it does, but I will not explain this. It's too too uh, complicated. Uh, X verfahren was the, 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 the main uh, uh, verbesserung, uh, was main, becomes main better because we only need now the, um, the, the, the main beam, yeah? but the, the other uh, the, 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 uh, cross beam we don't need because it was so. The, the distance f from the from the ground station in French to the point where we have to pull down the bombs were measured by uh, the, 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 the speed of the radio waves. They sent one signal to the to the aircraft. The aircraft sends back a signal, and in in this small time depends of the distance, yeah? So, the, the fly on the, uh, on the, on the main, uh, main beam, and as this is not erect, exactly known, the, the pilot press the, the knob to that fall the, the bomb, or the, the, the station in, in, the, in the ground, Put this knob that it automatically falls is falls a bomb. This is not ex, this is not exactly known. Yeah, that was the difference to the old uh, systems to the, the before systems, and more important, most important, to measure the uh, the distance with electronic in electronic way. Yeah. Uh, here you see some original uh, photo, photos where the, um, the English uh, in, found this system in crashed uh, aircraft. Yeah? And from, this, uh, from these photos, they calculate and so on and so on, and try, try to find what the, what the German now made with a new beam. Yeah? But this was not so easy, and they have not found this until the end of the war. Yeah, okay, here, here the pilot can see the course again, yeah? And this, uh, this is the uh, receiver, yeah? Receiver and also transmitter to, to talk with the, uh, with the other people and also to send back the signal for the measurement, yeah? And this is a very uh, complex system to, that the English not to quickly find out uh, how it's going with the, with the, with the beam. Yeah? Okay, <coughs> and later came also uh, an autopilot that the pilot has not the problems to, uh, to uh, find the correct way to come with this uh, autopilot. Also a very complex system. Yeah, and um, we have seen before the Fogge 17, also a receiver from Fogge 17 was used here in this system. Yeah, <coughs> uh, when we talk about the, uh, the uh, beams, was this the last uh, system was a, a measure, the measurement, the distance measurement by electric, how it works. 
Here on this uh, picture, you can see how one man is uh, working on this, uh, on this system. And uh, I have made a, only a demonstration model because such a, a complete a system is not available anywhere. Yeah? So, how it works? Here we have a transmitter. This transmitter sends a, sin sends a signal to the aircraft, but also on this valve. And from the aircraft comes back the signal yeah, by a um, um, transponder and what's received in this receiver. And from this receiver, also the signal goes on this um, a, a tube. So, but there was there was a, a, a difference from to the sea, to the plane back to the to the uh, ground station, and this difference is is shown here on two beams. If they are uh, not together, so they, so they out. Now <coughs> you can see the two lines, and have to to put the two lines together in kilometers and fine with this. Now, can, can, now I can look in the table where it's D and 0, 5. And I, from this table I can look how is the, is the distance to the aircraft. This is a, this is a typical method to, uh, to measurement the, uh, the distance. Okay, shortly we see here an electronic um, beam steuerung, Siemens KVÖ, very important and was made, uh, plenty made for, for plenty uh, um, uh, aircrafts in all in the world. What you see here, this is the, 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 the motor, the pump motor for the hydraulic. You see here a demonstration from the rudder. Yeah? You see here uh, the, the magnetic compass, yeah? you see here the magnetic compass, yeah? and the, you see here the Kurskreisel, you can see here the, the, the uh, point of the correct uh, direction, you see here the, the, uh, the compass uh, rows, and here you see the Steuerhorn, yeah? to drive right or left, or you can also make this so right and left, and so on. Here's the main switch. And here's the emergency knob. When the electronic is broken, you can push, uh, pull it and you can uh, normally steer the, uh, the uh, uh, aircraft. We have seen before the, uh, the, the steering from the from company Siemens, but only from the course. Yeah, right or left. But for, the, for an autopilot pilot, we need three, three motors for course, for um, right, left, and for the high, for altitude. Yeah? And this, the name from this heart is horizont motor, horizont mother. Yeah? So, okay. And now we see the system working. The, the uh, horizont motor was built in this house, yeah? and this house was closed and filled with gas because it's so um, sensitive, sensitive and has to be very clear, clear and clean and so on. But I have opened this so that you can see the, the, the main gyro. This is a, the gyro, and from this gyro, uh, came the singles for course, for right, left, and for the highs. Yeah, and I can. And here was an instrument, an, an instrument, the, the the captain or the the pilot uh, can control what happened. Yeah, maybe the the the, uh, the aircraft is goes down. This is a horizontal. Yeah, goes down. 
or goes high or makes a bow. Yeah? And this was all, and this was all automatically uh, steered. Yeah? You see here the test panel for the, uh, the uh, attitude meter for very uh, low distance. Yeah? The range was from uh, from 150 to what 70, 750 meters over the ground. Yeah? And, and with this system you can fly very nearly to the ground. Yeah? This was very important uh, when you uh, fly over the, over the uh, sea and uh, uh, air, aircraft with the normal altitude uh, meter with uh, air pressure follows you. Yeah? So. You mean when a uh, aircraft, a fighter aircraft, only has a air pressure altimeter? Correct. Uh, very imprecise. Yeah, in the dark. In, in the darkness. Yeah. In the darkness. Very yeah? dangerous. And, and the and the okay and the the antennas were so under the wing. Right wing, left wing. You see, here's the transmitter. Here's the receiver. Yeah. <coughs> what you see, he see here is the test panel for the Fuji. 102A. It is a uh, gross altitude meter with a range f until 4 kilometers. Yeah? Uh, it was used for the um, also to, to put up that or to have the correct uh, high for, for bombing. Yeah. So, under it works like a normally radar system. Here we have the transmitter under the one wing. Here we have the receiver antenna under the one left wing. So the signal goes down, reflection comes back, and uh, in, in, in this time the circle is running a little way. Yeah. Here is the Sichtgerät. Yeah. Uh, the, how, how to show what happened, and, and the receiver. Here's the transmitter, and here's the power, pl power supply. Very difficult. Yeah? <laughs> very, very plenty uh, uh, tubes in this, and so on. A very difficult uh, part. Okay. So, but. We are not in the air, we cannot uh, test it. But it gives a method to test it. We have here a normally cable from the television, 100 meter, and the signal from the transmitter is going down <coughs> and come here uh, in the, in the uh, uh, receiving area, goes back and comes one time more back. And this you can see here, uh, here, normally, the circle is, is closed, not, not completely is closed, yeah? But now I give, and you see here, a little, uh, and a looker. <laughs> you see this here? Here, by 300 kilometers, is a, is, a, is a small gap. Maybe you cannot see it, correct? No, I saw it then. Yeah? It goes from uh, 200 to 250 kilometers. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. So we, ca we can check this system. And so was also the principle by in the, uh, in the airfields workshop. Yeah. Good. What we see here is the last... Um, uh, detector from the uh, German aircrafts to find the uh, uh, English H2S system. H2S was very new 
and has a very, very uh, sh uh, high frequency and very, very short wavelengths. And for this new uh, uh, frequencies, the Germans has nothing. So, but they won't find now the, uh, the bombers with the uh, H2S system. And what they have done, they, they, they took a special antenna, yeah? This antenna was turning on top from the fighters, yeah? And, and this antenna turning was also seen on this screen. So, when there was in this, in this direction was an English bomber, they, they got on the screen a point, yeah? a bright point, shown here in this uh, uh, explanation. Here is the English bomber, yeah? the normal English bomber, and with this, with this uh, uh, H2S run on board. Here is a German, the German fighter with the turning the antenna and when the antenna is going, uh, is uh, uh, looking to here, then they got on the screen a bright point. So they have to turn the, the aircraft in this position to fly to the English bomber yeah? and to fight him. Yeah? And this you can see here on this screen, but this is uh, not so easy to see. Uh, uh, yeah, and but on, and to test this, this the system was this uh, box. The, the, the uh, soldiers told them, "Puck." Yeah. Yeah. So it works, and you can sim. You can simulate the H2S radio from the uh, from the uh, British aircraft, yeah, and can see it is it works or not. One question. Yeah. Did this system give them any any range information? It gives them direction information, but did it give any range information? Ranging not only the direction. So they still had to use their Di eyes. Direction the only, yeah, but they can but they can. Uh, uh, change how how bright, very bright, nearly, slowly bright, far away. Yeah. What you see here is a test panel for the tail warning radar. I started. We have to wait a moment. The waves become hot. Oh, okay, here we see the antenna system for the, for the uh, tail warning system. What we have seen before. In the in the in, in the beginning, you think you have to think this is the uh, wing, left wing, and under this the antenna for the transmission. And on the other wing of the aircraft, the same antennas to receive the signals. Yeah? But uh, the experience in the World War was the fighters came not in the same direction, they come from, 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 from uh, up. Yeah? And so they, um, they made a new antenna, this one. This is Yagi antenna we see in German, Yagi antenna. And the Yagi antenna, you see, looks up and see more early the fighters come from back uh, in the up position. This is also two antennas, one as the right uh, wing, one of the left wing, receiving, uh, transmitting, receiving. And here you see the direction of flying. Yeah, this was the antennas. Okay, so, off 
on. So, the tail warning for the, uh, for the German aircrafts to be sure that no, no fighters behind them. How it works. What we have seen on this screen. The radar principle is so, uh, uh, what impulse, radar impulse, go out and then the system is waiting for a reflex, reflection. And if there are some behind us, behind the uh, 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 aircraft, then you get here a point. Yeah, also a point. And when the point is here, it is very dangerous for the uh, German aircraft. Yeah? And in, in what distance, in what distance this uh, reflection is, you can here see, this is always three kilometers. Yeah? Uh, when, you, when the point is here, no problem. But when the point is here, very, very nearly, yeah? then you have to go down. Yeah? Okay, this, this is the, the, the typical radar prince, radar prince. This is a German tail warning called uh, Fugge 200, 217. 217. Yeah, this was, this is a, a transmitter. Receiver, yeah, junction box, power supply, and uh, this is the side, yeah. This was a um, tail warning, okay. Okay, we go here. And I show you the last. <laughs> yeah. Ah, here you show. I show you the night. The night fighter, Fogel two 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 zero. Name was Liechtenstein SN two. Yeah. So what we see here is the. Uh, the latest uh, German radar system for the night for the night fighters, yeah, to find in the night the English and American bombers, yeah. Um, this was done with this all equipment. I have made uh, this equipment so like it was on the test panel in the uh, workshops and the. Uh, and the uh, air, 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 air bases. The parts of this system, most important, the indicator for for high, low, and left and right. Yeah, this is the indicator. <coughs> then we have the uh, the, the um, antennas switch. This switch uh, uh, makes the antenna on top together, left right together right together or down together, yeah, automatically. <coughs> but you can also do this by this antenna switch, by hand. When you press these knobs, yeah, and then you can see, you see only here or only here, yeah. So, this is the transmitter, sends the signal to the aircraft, then signal comes back from the aircraft, and was the receiver, and with this, um, with this wheel, <coughs> you can adjust the receiver, that you have the best indication. Yeah? So, here is the power supply, and here is the uh, generator for the high tension, and this is the knob off, on, and the fuse. Yeah? On these two tubes, yeah, you, can, you can see a line, and here is also a line. On this line, you, you can see the, uh, the targets, 
the, uh, the, the enemies, um, in the distance, every point was two kilometers. Yeah? You can see in, the, in, your, in your direction how much it is more high or more low. Yeah? And on this display, you see the same in, in, in your, your, your direction, what is more right or more left. The Fuge 220 SN2 had a maximum target detection capability of about 8 kilometers, or 5 miles. Dieter explains that the areas bounded by the red ovals show ground artifacts or reflections. Because the aircraft flies at about 5,000 meters, or about 17,000 feet, and the Fuge 220 radar system looks down from the aircraft at an angle of about 30 degrees, so at typical operational altitudes, the system can see the ground as here in our simulation, at a distance of about 7,500 metres. Our simulated traces here show two enemy aircraft ahead of us. The nearest is about 5,000 metres, or about 5 kilometres away. The other is a bit further, at about 6,250 metres. The screen giving the target's azimuth bearing on the left shows the first target dead ahead, with the furthest target a little to the starboard, or right, of the centre line. We can see that the top spike in the red box, indicating the most distant target, extends further to the right of the centre. The altitude screen on the right shows the first target a little higher than our aircraft, and the furthest target is at a slightly lower altitude. Again, this is indicated by the first target spike being slightly longer above the centre line than below it. And for the second target, the spike is longer below the line than above it. In a moment, Dieter will switch the system on and you'll be able to see what these screens really look like and, amazingly, what the system might have sounded like to the crew aboard a German night fighter. But first, let's finish our roundup of the Fuge 220 SN2 hardware by looking at the antennas. Okay, here you see a picture from a German night fighter, Heinkel 290. And on this uh, uh, front of this aircraft, or four antennas yeah, for the uh, Fuge 220 SN2. Yeah? And what, what I have made, I, I made these uh, antennas here in repro reproduction, and you see the antennas in, this, in, the, in the correct dimensions, in distance, and also in, in this length, uh, in according with the, with the working um, the station. Yeah? And so the, the station you have seen before and the four uh, aerials, antennas, are working together so, and, and, and the dimensions is so like was in the original uh, 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 dimensions. Yeah? From here to here, from here to here, yeah, from here to here, and from here, from here to here. Yeah? Not, there's not this, this, this is not in here. This we don't need. Yeah? Dieter explains that the elements of the dipole antennas are long like this because the Fuge 220SN2 emits very low frequency transmissions. This was necessary to avoid interference from British electronic countermeasures in the form of aluminium chaff, codenamed Window. This was a technique to confuse radar systems, where attacking bombers would eject strips of aluminium foil or aluminium paper in large quantities, forming clouds like the one you can see in this picture of Lancaster bombers using window. The design of the antennas and their ability to operate together and as independent pairs gave the Fuge 220 a wide angle of target detection and made the system very effective, at least for a few months until new countermeasures were developed by the Allies. These antler-like antennas were very costly to the aircraft's speed and reduced its top speed by as much as 50 kilometers or 30 miles per hour. One of the factors that make Dieter's work of organizing this collection of equipment so unique is the fact that virtually everything on display here doesn't just look like it's in good condition visually, it's fully operational. And that includes the Fugi 220SN2. So Dieter is gonna power it up now and use a test signal generator so that you can see what the cathode ray tube displays looked like and, incredibly, what it might have sounded like to the crew of a German night fighter.
This sound came as a bit of a surprise to us, as it's coming through the radio microphone receiver we have attached to our camera. Now, we're not saying that the crew would have heard it as loud as you're going to hear it. The builders would have done everything they can to make sure that the electrical interference from the low-frequency radar system did not interfere with the onboard radio transmission and the intercom system. But trying and achieving are different things. And when you operate radio detectors and amplifiers close to other powerful radio transmission systems, even ones working on very different frequencies, it's pretty common to have harmonics and radio frequency spillage from the transmitter leaking into these other circuits. So I'm pretty sure the sound you're hearing would have been familiar to the night fighter crews that used the Fugi 220. They may have only heard it in the background, and then only if they pressed their headphones hard to their ears, but I'm sure this interference would have found its way into some piece of equipment on the plane, and they would have heard this sound. Left. I left. Where are the targets? Okay. I close. Okay, what you see here is a test panel for the uh, radar system uh, FOG 200, called also Hohentwil. What for what was it used? It was used to find the ships in the sea. Yeah, special the convoys were are coming from America to from uh, Canada to uh, support the English, yeah? So, and how it works. Here you see the transmission, transmitting antenna. Here you see the left, a left antenna, and here you see a right antenna. So, what, how is it working? The antenna, the transmission transmitter, sent a signal, and back came from the ship's reflection to left or to right. Is the signal from, from here, from here, from right, more strong than here, yeah? You have to turn the, the aircraft so that the, the reflection from left and from right are the, have the same length. And then you are flying direct to the ship and can fight it. And the distance you can see here on the, uh, um, uh, on the rail, rail tube uh, with, this, with, uh, with the scale uh, uh, names. Uh, but <coughs> it is uh, difficult to show how it works because we have no ship here. Yeah. <laughs> So, and for this gave an uh, artificial target, künstliches Ziel, yeah? Artificial. Künstliches Ziel. Artificial target. And, and this I have done here, and you can see what the operator sees, yeah? Here is, here is a, a, a ship target in three kilometers, yeah? Or for, exa yeah, for example, here in six kilometers, yeah? This is what the operator sees on this Gesichtgerät. Uh, on this. Uh, Cathode ray. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Ray yeah, yeah. So, here you see the same what I explained. On the right, the signal goes out to the, to the, uh, to the ship and comes back on the right antenna and on the left antenna. And so, you have the. the, the um, the aircraft steering, that, the, that you have the same length, right and left, and then you are fly direct on the ship. Yeah? And here you can see the distance, how many, how many uh, uh, kilometers. Yeah? You can hear on this, on this scale. Yeah. Here you see the, the, young, the junction box, and so on. And this system was also used in uh, the submarine. Ah, here you can see once more transmitting antenna, receiving an antenna left, receiving antenna right. Yeah? 
That was, a, that was the principle from this radar system. What we have here, here we have the receiver, here we have the transmitter, here we have the power supply, okay, here is the, 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 the sync system. Here is the, uh, um, yeah, this is a switch box, this is a switch box, yeah. yeah. So. Let's hear the uh, generator. Attention. And see, after 10 minutes running this, you can switch on. <laughs> we have to wait 10 minutes for this noise. That's enough to wake the dead, basically, is what we say about that. That's right to wake the dead. Yeah, I won't uh, put this uh, generator in another room. But it, would have, it would have been down the fuselage, wouldn't it? It wouldn't have been that close to the men. It would have been a little bit up Yeah, yeah, this was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, I tell you, when the, uh, the crew are not sure this is running, yeah, they cannot listen because they have the motors and, yeah. and they mean so. Wind? Okay. Uh, imagine not knowing if that yeah, was running. There's <laughs> wind? Okay, it's working. Yeah, yeah. Not the noise. Yeah, yeah. So, but very important, and I have to show this because I'm so surprised about this wonderful system. Made the company was Lowlands, yeah, and the, and the Lowlands has made this, yeah. This are the a, a transmitter, a push pull, push pull, push pull transmitter, yeah. Also. Here are the tubes, and this, and this is transmitter in push pole, and the power of this was 30,000 watts, 30,000 watts peak, yeah? And here is the modulator, <coughs> the modulator, how many times came this signal in a second? Yeah? And this was made with this very nice tube. We have here then more uh, 800 amperes. 800 amperes was running through this tube. Yeah? Okay, receiver is also a very good, uh, very good made. Here you see uh, also very nice uh, tubes for in this time. Yeah? Here too. Yeah, okay, this, this was the Fogi uh, 200 called in Germany Hohentwil. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Ah, here also very important. This is some, some parts from the ground station, very good known by Würzburg. Volksburg. Würzburg. This was the rad radar flap seal, yeah, to uh, to give the uh, the flak, you know what is flak? Yeah, the flak. The yeah, yeah, and make so <coughs> this system gives the the the, 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 the flak screw, yeah, how to how to uh, switch the the angel from the from the from the gun, uh, how to switch the distance from the gun and so and give automatically here some signals, yeah, and the the um, the crew from the flag has to turn so that this is, yeah and then the hope the the meet <laughs> the aircraft yeah so this was this was the flag cigarette. What we have to do here with Flugmeldung, that is uh, uh, how to find, uh, how, how to find and to identify an aircraft you cannot see with the glass. Yeah? So, and this was here, here you can see an overview, the overview. 
Here you see, you get here a point. Over you, right, the right angel, and here you can see the left angel. Yeah. So, and and now it's most important. Is is this noon? Now, uh, enemy or is this a friend? What I see on the, yeah, I have to, I have to shut or not. <laughs> yeah. and so, and so. In this system was a receiver, and the the Würzburg uh, gave a beam to the unknown aircraft. So. And, and, you know, now, is this friend or is this uh, uh, enemy? Friend or foe. So, yeah. so, and then... No, and to find the enemy or not the enemy was this radio, uh, a friend, Freund, find Canada, Germany. So, the Würzburg... Uh, see uh, an aircraft on the on the screen, but now is this friend or is this enemy? So automatically send a signal here, and automatically the signal comes back, and the signal that comes back uh, was a code, a code, and the code was given by a, a special key. Yeah, this is a special key. And was so uh, broken, yeah. The teeth are so broken, and so they get, for example, from this key, the dot dash dot, yeah. Or and this change every every half hour. That not the enemy think. Oh, this then this. I said this to him, yeah. And so change here, for example, dot dot dash dot, yeah. And so uh, came this signal on this display, and they know, okay, this is some from us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is normally, I think, called a transponder. Transponder. This is correct. Yeah. Transponder oh, specialist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We go to the next station. Here is the. The BZA was an analog computer system designed to process a range of critical aircraft sensor and pilot inputs to calculate the precise bomb release point, typically for aircraft like the Ju-88 and the Arado AR-234 executing dive bomb attacks. The BZA computer was able to process moment-to-moment -moment critical aircraft data, including altitude, speed, wind, track, and dive angle, as well as target data related to position and geo-altitude. The information was updated in real time and presented in a simple active terrain overlay reticule of the Stuvi dive bomb site. Here's Dieter Baikirsch to tell you more. What do you, do you, do you bombing man uh, see? Uh, he, he sees the target, yeah? Maybe the... Uh, the, the uh, Factory or so as a target, and here is the mark. The, the mark is moving. He sees the target, and here is the, the mark. And when when he, uh, it is so that the target and the mark is together, then is the correct position, and he has to press the bomb knob. So yeah, and I have told on the on the on the picture. So this is a, the, the aircraft comes and goes so down and and, and it falls in the bomb. But to have the right position, he has to look in this glass. He he sees the target and and also in the glass to see a mark. And when the mark is over the target, then he has to press and leave, and leave the bomb. Yeah, so, but when the, when the, uh, the aircraft flies, 
it has speed. We have range from right and left. We have different um, air pressure and so on. And all these parameters, all these parameters was uh, calculated by this computer. This is a, this is a, a electromechanic computer. Yeah, you see here. When, yeah, you see, it's working here. Yeah, yeah, and all this 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 movement from the from the uh, from the aircraft changes the 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 dot or the here going all the the speed or the height now we are two kilometers up yeah oh here's the speed Yeah. So these parameters depend of the correct point of target. Yeah. So, and uh, what I can show you, he has to look the inside, and there is a point, and this point has uh, has to stay over the target, and then he can press. Yeah. This is a function of this very difficult system yeah uh, I, I can show something here here you see the the um, the motors give the position to this point yeah train train yeah and here speed Yeah, and, and how 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 it's done? This is the uh, electric system. Yeah, it's the same movie makes make this. This was also in, in Fugit ten the same. Yeah, I move here, and I and for for, for the computer. Is here, moves here. It's worth pausing for a moment to consider the remote control technology that Dieter is referring to here, as it's not very visible today. It's the system that allowed the Stuvi's dive attitude and bomb release computer to be constantly updated by automatic flight sensors and manual pilot input, and for the computer to instantly update the Stuvi's cockpit optical sight. Many military and industrial control systems use the same technique from the 1930s to the 1960s, but it's rarely seen today. Called synchro control transmitters and receivers, the system is sometimes referred to by its once popular name CELSIN, a shortened version of self-synchronizing. This device is a synchro receiver, one end of a system used to transmit an angular position from one location to another. You can see that the devices, especially the smaller ones, look just like ordinary electric motors. And mechanical connections for gear trains and drive shafts can be attached to the rotor spindle in the same manner as motors. But in fact, they're not motors at all. Synchro units are transformers. Synchros typically have five cables, two for power and three to control the rotor position. In a synchro system, the transmitter windings and the receiver windings can be thought of as the primary and secondary windings of a transformer. The voltage induced in the receiver windings is proportional to the angle of rotation of the transmitter shaft, and the receiver rotates to the same angle as the transmitter as a result of the induced voltage. Here's a little model we've made. You can imagine it's the gun turret on the deck of a ship that has to communicate with the fire control officer in the plotting room. I can move this bearing needle and wherever I point, the gun dutifully follows, matching the movements perfectly. Wherever the needle points, the gun points in precisely the same direction. And 
with some upper speed limitations, it moves quickly or slowly as I choose. And as you can see, it works just as well with the gun acting as the transmitter. One notable feature of synchro units is their resolution. In the split screen demo here, even the smallest movements I make have surprisingly precise corresponding movements resolved on the remote device. Another useful feature is that they're self-synchronizing, without any calibration or additional adjustment. If I cut the power and adjust one unit so that it's out of phase and synchronization with the other, as soon as I restore power, they instantly return to synchronization. And it works just as well the other way around. And this is all done without control boards, firmware, chips, logic boards, you name it. Just the laws of Faraday, Lentz and Ohm. It's precise, fast and tough technology. Very difficult to defeat. You have to penetrate deeply into a weapon system that uses it. James Bond isn't going to twiddle something on his watch to change this control system. No, no, I'll start this test system. Yeah. And I have to put into the calculator some parameters. Yeah. For example, now ready, really ready. <laughs> I have to put in the uh, calculator some parameters. Wind. Wind change. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the air pressure, millibar, and the altitude directly over the target. I have to, I have to, to that is the altitude from barometer, altitude meter. I have to put inside the speed. So, and we have, I have to show you the angel. Yeah. Here you can see. Again. And also speed. What is this one, Dean? What is that one? Uh, uh, that seems to be changing with the angle. That seems to change with the angle. Yeah, this is angel. This is the angel. And the one at the back. And this one is the... Uh, the visier winkel. Like the same with the, uh, with the angel. The visier winkel. This is the... The visor angle. The visor being the bomb side, so this will be the control angle for the uh, the mark, the pip up. Here, here you can here you can see the uh, altitude. Yeah. The Henschel HS-293 was a radio-controlled glide bomb primarily intended for use against ships. The HS-293 was the world's first guided missile to be effective in combat. Today we would call this type of weapon a standoff missile, and with around 30 hits on Allied shipping with several sinking, the HS-293 was the world's most successful anti-ship missile until the French Exocet developed three decades later. Based around a 500 kilogram airdrop bomb, the weapon was manually guided into the target by sight using the target cover method. This dictates that the missile must remain in the line of sight of the controlling bombardier so that he can keep the missile superimposed on the target. Here the HS-293 is dropped from a carrier aircraft, a Heinkel HE-111. After a second or two of free fall, the missile gets clear of the aircraft and begins to drop behind. 
a small liquid fuel rocket engine ignites and burns for 10 seconds, propelling the glide bomb to about 900 kilometers per hour, around 370 to 400 kilometers per hour faster than the Heinkel. The missile must be ahead of the control plane and between the bombardier and the target. A test target the size of a small ship has been set up in the Friesendorfer marshes just northwest of Peenemünde. The test is 100% successful. Yeah, what you see here. The HS-293 radio-controlled rocket-boosted glide bomb could be carried under a range of Luftwaffe aircraft. As an anti-ship missile, it lacked the penetrating power to be effective against ships with heavy armour. But it was effective against merchant ships and smaller Navy support vessels. As a method of bombing Allied shipping, the HS-293 was much safer for the attacking aircraft than conventional dropped ordnance, as at no point was it required to be above the target or approach it directly. It was safer and even more accurate than a torpedo attack. Again, the attacking aircraft was not required to make a direct approach to the target, thereby increasing its vulnerability. With the glide bomb, the attacking aircraft could stand off a safe distance, staying out of range of the defender's guns for the complete attack maneuver. Dieter points out that the glide bomb could be used to attack shipping from a range of about three and a half kilometers to around 18, about two to 11 miles, and from an altitude from 200 to 4,000 meters, so about 600 to 12,000 feet. So operationally, a very flexible weapon. The missile was powered by a small Valter rocket engine, delivering a thrust of around 600 kilograms or 1,300 pounds, and was mounted in a pod underneath the main body. Presented here are the principal components of the Fugit 230 radio receiver and guidance control system on board the missile. This is the receiver unit. We can see the P2000 pentode valves here and two Siemens telegraph relays to switch the directional control surface servos. And on the other side, another row of P2000 valves. And, um, the unit with the two plugs facing the camera is essentially a filter system that discriminates the important control signals from the total signal received. This is the distribution system that everything else connects to. A small motor generator or umformer here. The stabilization gyro is seen here. This gyro keeps the wings level and is vital to the control stability of the missile. Dieter demonstrates the gimbal release mechanism automatically activated at launch. The missile has no rudder on the ventral stabilizer, so left and right steering is accomplished by ailerons on the trailing edge of the main wings. The gyro stabilizes the missile and restricts any tendency to roll by positively restricting the bank angle and restoring level flight after an aileron movement command is executed. And here is the uh, uh, special motor for, for, for 500 hertz and so on. And also was here... The device on the back wall here labelled Hohen Rudder Machine is an important mechanism that simplifies the remote control of the missile's elevator controlling the altitude. Because the velocity of the missile can vary on its trajectory from the launch point to target, decelerating by as much as 600 kilometers per hour, the missile has a dynamic pressure airspeed measurement system that controls a motor generator or TACO dynamo as it was called so that the strength of the elevator's control signal, and thereby the elevator's angle of attack, is varied in proportion to the airspeed. Simply put, when the missile is going fast, the elevator deflection angles are small, but when the missile has slowed, typically at the end of the run near the target, the elevator deflection angles will be larger, so that the remote pilot is able to maintain a consistent feel for the behavior of the missile in flight making the remote missile more responsive and more consistent in flight control. We can see the connection for the elevator push-pull rod here. Although all production HS-293As used in combat employed an aileron left-right steering control, an experimental version of the HS-293 used spoilers to simplify the control system. The spoiler mechanism was hidden in the wing and was flush with the wing surfaced when not operating. Dieter demonstrates the method of operation. Go, go so, when, when, when plenty, 
go right, when you go slowly, go left, and so on. A similar spoiler system was used on the Fritz X. The avionics equipment was attached to both sides of a mounting plate in the control compartment of the missile, situated just behind the payload. The antennas for the Fugi 230 control system were mounted at the tips of the glide bomb's horizontal stabilizer. The bomb, we have seen everything, but what is in the aircraft? In the aircraft is this system, this is transmitter, transmitter and the antennas to send the signals to the flying bomb. The circuitry you see here, a simple circuitry, you see here, this is the, the antenna, the an, antenna matching, this is the, um, the, the power supply, this is a, a transmitter, this is the Zeitgeber, we say in German, and the reason was this. The Zeitgeber, or timer, allows the transmitter to run at reduced power while the missile is near the carrier aircraft. Too much transmitter power could overwhelm the receiver and cause problems. The timer allowed a delay of up to six seconds before full power was restored as the missile began to increase its range from the control transmitter. The frequency of the transmitter was very precisely controlled by a quartz oscillator. This location of the quartz crystal was equipped with an explosive pellet, so that in the event of a crash, or another situation where the aircraft may fall into the hands of the enemy, the quartz crystal could be destroyed to keep the control frequency a secret. Now, here we see the, uh, the bombing man who is steering the bomb by eyes with this joystick, yeah? And uh, what, what, he, what he has to do there? For this, I have to, uh, to uh, open the machine, yeah? This machine is turning, yeah? And you can see what, what, he, is, what he makes when he makes so. This is a rudder for high, up in the sky and down in the water, yeah? So the steering is working, yeah? Down, high, <laughs> and here, left and right, yeah? So was the steering. And how, how was done this? The HS-293 uses a pulse mode control system. The noisy mechanical nature of the joystick surprises some, are two wheels. but the simple motor-driven system allows the control switch gear in the box to generate a unique pulse time pattern that's transmitted to the bomb and translated into control surface positions. The fundamental frequency, about 25 Hz, is fixed. Only the pulse lengths vary depending on the joystick positions. I hope you can see this. Yeah? Okay. What you see more on this uh, bombing man uh, position here. Maybe you can here see, <coughs> this is the control for the 24 volts, the control for the 210 volts for the uh, pentodes anode tension. <laughs> here you see the high frequency, high frequency power. Here we see what is selected. We have two types of fire bomb, was einmal Fritz X, for this is the X, or the Henschel, for this is the H, yeah? This is selected so. And here you can select the four bombs was possible uh, on, to, 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 to carry from the, uh, from the uh, aircraft. So you have to select, yeah? And uh, what more? Here you, ha here you have uh, to, to see the temperature, uh, in, in the bomb, left, right, medium, one, me, medium, uh, uh, one. So, and uh, with this, uh, with this uh, switch, you can select the uh, thermometers, yeah? And with this, you can make a fuckel, what is a fuckel, a, a light on the, on the backlight, you can make a backlight. It was a flare, in fact, wasn't it? The flare, yeah, back, back light, yeah. So that you can better watch the bomb when it's dusty and it's dark and so on. That you can see where is where is the bomb to, yeah, you can better see it, see, see it. But 
when you will start this bomb, yeah, you see now will start to press here. Yeah? And the bomb leaves the uh, carrying aircraft. The socket connector Dieter is showing us here is the umbilical connection from the missile to the carrier aircraft. This socket is on the missile. We've seen the steering by radio, but Dieter points out that concern about British and American electronic countermeasures led to the development of a wire-guided system. Up to four reels of thin wire could be used for a maximum range of 30 kilometers, or just short of 20 miles. The long wire had a high electrical resistance, so the system had a special 200 volt power supply. This was the, we told to this Drahtlenkung, a steering by wire, but later was also a steering by television. So it was in the, in the bomb in front, um, a camera, television camera, and you can watch this on this screen. Yeah, that, that was the last, uh, but this with the, with, the, um, with the television was not okay and uh, was never in, uh, in action. Just before we end, we're going to show you an extraordinary and rare piece of film. Captured in 1944, using a cine camera set up to record the CRT display, like the one in the picture, in the carrier aircraft used to launch and control an experimental HS-293D. The view we see is from on board the missile as it glides at about 350 kilometers per hour towards a test target of what are probably disused barges anchored off the coast between Usedom and Lubmin. Boom. And that brings us to the end of this video. We've done pretty much what we set out to do, which was take a tour of Dieter's stunning collection and highlight along the way some of the most historically significant German aircraft electronics. If you've stuck with us this long, uh, it's a fair bet that you're as keen on Valvera avionics as we are, and uh, especially as it applies to the Second World War later on in this series, as well as exploring the history and function of fermionic valves, we'll be homing in, as usual, on some instrumentation, like the control electronics of the V2 missile. So if you don't want to miss anything, don't forget to subscribe. It does help us on the channel as well. And maybe click the bell icon so that uh, every time we upload something new to the channel, you get a notification. Until next time, from Dieter and me, bye for now.